Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're finally going to be discussing the iconic James Webb Telescope, and essentially just talking about the natural of its mission, comparing it to the Hubble Telescope, and explaining why it looks the way it looks. And so if you just wanted to find out what this telescope is all about, and how it compares to some of the other missions, this is the video for you. But officially, I was actually planning to make this video after the official launch, and after the confirmation that everything works fine. However, the launch seems to be delayed even more now. So at the time of making this video, the telescope is still on the ground here on planet Earth. And although these delays by now have become almost like a joke, in reality, there's a really good reason for this. This has been an extremely expensive product, and it's also been an extremely important product that at the moment NASA is just trying to protect and trying to make sure that everything succeeds as it's supposed to. In other words, NASA, ESA, and Canadian Space Agency responsible for creating this have just been extremely careful and trying to make sure that everything goes as planned. But without further ado, let's just jump into the facts and with what we know about the telescope and its structure. So first of all, why exactly does the telescope look like this? Where most of the other space telescopes, including Hubble, looked like this. And the reason for its unusually futuristic shape is actually due to the design involved and due to its mission, its primary mission, in regards to the type of light it's going to be observing. So first of all, let's start with this unusual shape on the bottom. The five layers you see right here underneath the telescope itself. In a nutshell, this is basically a very complicated sun shield, made out of a really thin material and also extremely expensive material known as Kapton. This is, in essence, what we sometimes use here on planet Earth to reflect sunlight to, for example, protect your car from being overheated. But here, it's taken to a completely new level. First of all, there are five layers of this. Second of all, it's extremely thin. It's also extremely expensive. And it's also been one of the main reasons for one of the delays. One of the layers here unfortunately ripped, causing the further delays while some of the layers were reconstructed. And the main function of the structure is to reflect as much sunlight as possible in order to keep the telescope as cool as possible, with the goal of the shield being the temperature of about 50 Kelvin, which is about minus 223 degrees Celsius or about minus 370 degrees Fahrenheit. And so by positioning itself with the shield facing the sun and also planet Earth, all of the instruments inside this part right here are going to be kept at extremely cold temperatures. So really, the main purpose for this unusual structure is the temperature control. But the first question here is, why is it being done? And the second question is, how exactly is this telescope going to make sure that it's always positioned in the same way? Because it is going to be orbiting the solar system. Well, to answer the second question, which is actually a little bit easier, we're going to jump into the space engine into this location right here. Right now, we're in L2 Lagrange point, with this right there being planet Earth. And I actually have to zoom in quite a lot here for you to even see our planet. There it is. We're approximately 1.5 million kilometers away from Earth right now. And this point is a stable gravitational point known as Lagrange 2 that's formed by the interaction between the Sun and planet Earth. A lot of different telescopes have been placed there, and you can actually in theory place a telescope or any object there, and it's going to stay in permanent orbit without falling into the Sun or into planet Earth. But in practice though, you do need to spend just a little bit of fuel in order to maintain the orbit occasionally. And so essentially by hovering in the L2 point 1.5 million kilometers away from planet Earth, James Webb Telescope is going to be able to maintain a constant position and also a constant orientation toward planet Earth and of course toward the Sun. This way the temperature here is always going to be extremely low because of that sun shield. But why the low temperature? Well, that's actually the primary mission. The primary mission of this telescope is not to observe the optical light like the Hubble telescope, but to now start observing wavelengths that are very, very difficult to observe from planet Earth and have only been partially observed by some of the other telescopes, including Hubble. And here we're talking about the wavelength that's right here. It's basically invisible to most telescopes on the planet because it's absorbed by the atmosphere, the infrared wavelength. And so unlike Hubble that observed near ultraviolet visible and near infrared light, or roughly around 200 nanometers to approximately 2.4 microns of wavelength, James Webb Telescope is going to be much better at observing wavelengths of 600 nanometers to approximately 28 microns. 
Or in other words, it's going to be able to see orange light, red light, and a lot of infrared light. But not so much anything that's in blue light, nothing in ultraviolet, and nothing below 28 micron. And since a lot of warm objects, hot objects, and of course our bodies right now, produce infrared radiation, if you have a telescope whose main purpose is to try to detect infrared light, you want to keep everything inside of it, including the mirrors and the instruments, at the lowest possible temperature in order to avoid interference. And so in a nutshell, the majority of the complexity for the design here is simply to observe the infrared light without any interference from either the Sun or planet Earth that also produces some infrared light as well. And that's also the reason for this particular location in the solar system. And a lot of these wavelengths that are going to be assessed by the telescope have actually been extremely difficult to study even with Hubble. For example, the Hubble telescope used to have its own infrared detector as well. It was known as the Near Infrared Camera and Multi-Object Spectrometer, responsible for taking some of the most iconic infrared pictures in the solar system. But this device had to be actively cooled down in order to be able to observe infrared frequencies. This was done by using an extremely complex liquid system using an extremely sophisticated liquid gas loop that essentially evaporated with time, making the device kind of useless. It was later replaced by another device, the even more complicated Wide Field Camera 3, but even this is still very difficult to cool down in order to see the infrared radiation. But it's really because of these devices and because of the early observations in the infrared light that the scientists realized that they actually had to have an infrared telescope simply because of the discoveries made by both Hubble telescope and another infrared telescope known as Spitzer. This was the best infrared telescope NASA had for many years and it was retired, officially retired, in 2020. It functioned for over a decade and it actually produced incredible images and uncovered a lot of mysteries. Because of these discoveries, the scientists realized that the infrared observations would be the most important for the future of astronomy. For example, a lot of distant objects, a lot of distant galaxies, and here we're talking about galaxies billions and billions of years old, are actually most visible in the infrared light because of the redshifting effects as the light travels away from those galaxies. The most distant galaxies to date, and here we're talking about the iconic GN-Z11, is essentially only really visible in the infrared light. And that's because all of the super highly energetic ultraviolet light and a lot of other light that's created in this galaxy due to the distance traveled eventually become infrared by the time they reach planet Earth. And so in order to study some of these mysteries of the ancient universe and to see even farther and deeper into the ancient space and to possibly uncover some of the even older galaxies, NASA realized that they needed a much better infrared telescope. And that's how the initial ideas for the James Webb were born back in the 90s. And although its initial budget was estimated at about $500 million, with the initial launch sometime in the early 2000s, eventually due to further delays, due to further complications, and a lot and a lot of problems, both in its development and of course some of the designs, the total cost now stands at nearly $10 billion, with the launch finally being, I guess, 2021. Hopefully, fingers crossed. I'm still making this, I guess, in the past from when the telescope hasn't launched yet, but it's already in a rocket and it seems to be fueled up and ready to go. Let's hope everything goes as planned. Anyway, back to the telescope and its unusual design. What about this mirror here? Well, as you can probably see, it's extremely large. And that's actually the reason for its unusual shape. Once again, unlike the Hubble telescope, whose mirror is just over 2.4 meters, or roughly around 7 feet 10 inches in size, the mirror on the James Webb telescope is actually much larger. And because of this, and also because we don't really have any other ways of delivering these massive telescopes to space, this mirror had to be designed with the ideas from the Japanese origami in mind. It had to fold up, and it had to unfold in a very easy fashion. For this, the scientists decided to use hexagons that would actually fold up in just the right way in order to fit inside the rocket. Here's actually what all this looks like underneath the rocket's fairings, with the mirror itself, as you can see, folded in just the right way. But here's what the mirror is going to look like once unfolded, much bigger than the one on Hubble. It's about 6.5 meters across, or approximately 21 feet. And it's also made out of gold-plated beryllium, with the material chosen specifically for those frequencies mentioned before. And in this case, gold is used because it magnifies the infrared reflections and allows the telescope to capture way more infrared light than would be possible otherwise. 
But there are so many other infrared objects this telescope is going to be able to discover. A lot of rogue planets that we've mentioned in many other videos, a lot of brown dwarfs, a lot of objects that are otherwise hidden, possibly even seeing some of the reflections from actual planets around star systems, and also a lot of other radiation that usually passes through dust and is not really blocked by dust at all, but is invisible to a lot of other telescopes because they're just not sensitive enough. And even things like planetary disks usually produce mostly infrared light as well, so all of this is going to be visible to this telescope with detail that we've never had before. And so that's the basic facts. Now let's talk about some other additional details, specifically based on some of the questions I've been receiving in the last few months. First of all, why exactly is NASA taking this all the way to the a location right here in South America in French Guiana known as Kourou Launch Site? Well, the main reason for this is really twofold. First, because this is the European Space Agency's main launch location. And back in the days, ESA agreed to be the launching partner for this telescope in order to participate in all of this. But second of all, it's because it's very, very close to the equator. And here it sort of helps to look at the map on Google Earth. This is where the telescope is launching from, with the only alternative that NASA would have would be somewhere right here in Florida. Kourou is much closer to the equator, and because of this it actually gets an additional boost from the spin of our planet. And although it's not a huge increase, it's about 100 km per hour or so, it still counts when it comes to extremely heavy telescopes and very expensive launches. So in this case it's basically to add additional propulsion to the launch itself. By using the location at the equator, it helps NASA to save a little bit of fuel and to potentially add a little bit more into the telescope. And because the telescope is also going to have a relatively complex orbital path that's going to take approximately 30 days before it becomes fully operational, NASA decided to take the safest route when it comes to launches. They chose the safest rocket available for heavy launches, which was the ESA's Ariane 5 rocket, and they also chose the site that would allow them to have the safest possible launch profile with the overall orbital path resembling something like this. This is the top view here, and this is what the telescope is going to be doing for many years to come. It's actually going to be assuming this halo orbit that you see in this simulation, and the thing is, this is maybe one of the main reasons why the telescope has a limited time span. Its current mission is set to be in about 10 years long, and that's not because it's going to become old or possibly become destroyed by something, it's actually because it's going to run out of fuel to support its orbit. Because of this unusual halo orbit, it's going to be boosting its orbit by about 4 meters per second every single year, and the total propulsion here will only last it for maximum 10 years. In other words, this telescope also has its own boosters, and these boosters are going to be keeping its orbit. But at the same time, it's also a bit unclear if the micrometeorites might also play a role in maybe damaging some of the parts here, either the mirrors or maybe even the uh, sun shield itself. And if something else, like a micrometeorite, ends up damaging the telescope in the next year or so, it's really uncertain if this is going to affect the mission in any way. There is absolutely no way for NASA to repair this like they used to do with Hubble many times in the past. This telescope is just way too far away, and there's currently no ability for anyone to repair these telescopes once they become damaged or once something happens. And because of this, NASA's strategy so far has just basically been being extremely careful in every single step which so far seems to have worked pretty well. The telescope, despite all of the damages and all of the setbacks, seems to be ready to go. And if you're watching this from the future, you probably already know what happened. But I guess until further updates, or until some of the most incredible discoveries from this telescope, for now that's all I wanted to mention. You can find some of the additional links in the description below. And in order to celebrate this launch, and also if you'd like to support this channel, you can also potentially buy one of the new t-shirt designs that's going to be available in the description as well. On that note, hopefully this answered all of your questions about this telescope, and if you have more of them, make sure to post them in the comments below, and I'll try to answer when I can. Thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and come back in the future to learn more about the telescope and all of its successes. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining a channel membership or through the purchase of the t-shirt. And either way, I'll see you tomorrow, stay wonderful, and as always, bye-bye.